why would, why would someone write a book about fail, essentially about failure? And, and I'll tell you the story of the book. I was, um, I was on the phone with a guy that I used to work for, and he was smarter than I, he was more accomplished than I, and I hadn't talked to him about 15 years. And I asked him about his wife, I asked him about his kids, I asked how he, how he liked living in New England. And then I asked him about his career, and I could hear the disappointment in his voice as he talked about it. And he hadn't reached the level of achievement that he should have, given his level of talent. And I hung up the phone, and I wrote on a sticky, what impedes the progress of talented people? And I put it on my, on my wall at, at, at work, at Kellogg. And that's the first reason. I thought, I wonder if there are traits or characteristics or skill gaps that cause people that should do well to derail. The second reason I wrote this book is I had a derailment event in my career that I will, I've actually had more than one. I'm going to talk about one in particular, and I'll get into that as we hit this section in the book. And so, you know, they say teach what you know or write what you know. Well, I'm writing what I know, which is derailment. So that's why I'm writing this. There is this big emphasis right now on the strengths movement. You know, now discover your strengths, Tom Rath's book, Strength Finders 2.0, and I think it's terrific. When I talk to Kellogg students, they are so clear on what they think they're strong at. And then I ask them, well, what about you could hurt you? And I get, you know, these sideways looks. No, no, tell me, where are you vulnerable? Where do you think you might have a soft spot that you need to work on? And I don't get good answers. And so I thought, I've got to bring this topic to light because no matter how talented we are, there's nothing like you know, a glaring deficiency that can sweep us at the knees. So that's why I wrote this book. Okay, so why do talented people not achieve their expected level of development? And I also did the flip side of the coin. I thought, are there traits or characteristics or competencies that high potential, high performers have that allow them to exceed. And so sure, I spent another nine months after I was finished with the book and went back out and looked at that topic. And so you're gonna see both sides of the coin here. I'll spend more time on derailment, but I'll also spend some time on what do high potential high performers do differently, okay? So I've spent three years doing this book, and what's great is there is a lot of information on this topic. You just have to mine 360 feedback forms. 360s are where your peers, your subordinates, and your superiors evaluate you, and you evaluate yourself, and you see how clear they are or you are, and if you match up. And so I looked at Corn Ferry and other databases of 360 feedback forms, and I said, what do people in the top 10% of their organization, what competencies do they have? People that are in the bottom quartile what deficiencies do they have based on 360s? So this was very data intensive, and I'll show you what I found. Okay, so this is not a niche topic. Half to two-thirds of us will experience a derailment event. What do I mean by a derailment event? This is when you're expected by the HR department, by your boss, by the organization you work for, to go higher in the organization, and for some reason, you don't achieve the expected level of performance. A couple caveats with this definition. One is, organizations are complicit. This isn't just about the employee. This is also about organizations moving us too quickly, not, uh, not making superiors develop us, shying away from difficult conversations, especially if our performance is good, and so we don't hear what we need to hear about ourselves. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I didn't look at this topic of derailment for personal reasons. If you derailed because you decided not to move from Boulder because you love the lifestyle, good for you. If you derailed because you're a triathlete and you wanna you know, work 30 hours a week, good for you. If you derailed because you have children and you said, I'm gonna work three days a week and, and I'm not gonna progress any further, that's your own decision. I looked here at people who wanted the brass ring and for some reason weren't able to achieve it. Is there, are there common things that they do poorly that impedes their progress? Okay, so 
I found five reasons over and over and over. Talking to executive recruiters, talking to coaches, talking to HR professionals, interviewing 100 people who got fired or demoted, I found five reasons that occurred over and over, and I'm gonna get into them right now. To make the topic more accessible and less scary, I created these archetypes, okay? These characterizations. So when people could talk about their derailment propensities, it isn't so scary. They could say, yeah, I'm a bit of a captain, fantastic. You know, so that's why you see these kind of crazy drawings up here. So the first reason is interpersonal issues. This is the guy who bruises you on his quest for the corner office with his sharp elbows. He mansplains probably, he has poor listening skills, and he performs well, but eventually we all find that we miss our quarter or miss our year, and people are not there to help him because he alienates them. So, what does he do specifically? Number one, he has relational issues. Insensitivity, defensiveness, poor listening skills, uh, I, me, mine. And that is a real problem as people get higher and higher in organizations. We start thinking we have the answers and we stop listening. And as we all know, the frontline people know more than we do because they're closest to the customer. Talking to your customer sales associates makes all the sense in the world. Talking to people who are actually designing the product. And as we get up in these senior levels, it's pretty easy to start thinking that you can, you know, you believe your own press. And the hubris is what happens to this individual. So this derailer happens a lot of times mid to senior management in careers. But there's another interesting aspect of Captain Fantastic that I was fascinated with. The second thing, dark, dark side personality traits. This is kind of Jungian almost. So dark side personality traits. How do we behave under pressure where we actually self-sabotage? So dark side personality traits. This woman named Karen Horney, who is a clinical psychiatrist in the 40s and 50s, wrote these marvelous books and said that people with everyday neuroses do one of three things. They move away from people, they detach. They move against people, they get aggressive. Or they move towards people by being, by being compliant. So Robert and Joyce Hogan took Karen Horney's work and they established the Hogan Development Survey, the Hogan Personality Inventory. And it is a very robust way to assess people and for a person to assess their own dark side tendencies. They mapped to Horney 11 characteristics, ways we can hurt ourselves. And you can see that first block is moving away. The second block is moving against. And that third area is being ingratiating. So Brooke, who uh, has, does the Hogan for many, many people, can tell you that nearly all of us have at least one of these characteristics that spikes. Most people have two and three. I had two. So most of us don't know what they are. There's a recent H Harvard Business Review article on self-awareness. 10 to 15% of people in this meta-analysis of thousands and thousands of workers, 10 to 15% of the people had accurate self-awareness. And they divide self-awareness into internal self-awareness and external self-awareness. Internal being how well do you understand yourself, how well do you understand your motives, how well do you understand your value system, how well do you understand your behaviors, and external self-awareness being how well do you understand how people view you, and how well can you read situations. So some people have one and not the other. They can have external, external self-awareness, where they can read situations clearly, and I have high external self-awareness, but I had poor internal self-awareness. I didn't understand my own motives. So I found myself burnt out, which is what Rob Walcott was referring to. I was burnt out eight years ago and didn't like my career. So we have to have both. We have to understand ourselves and what drives us, but we also understand how we're perceived. 10 to 15% of us have, self -awareness, have high self-awareness. So. What happened to me? There I am at Kellogg. Ta-da! 
1991. Derailed. I got out of Kellogg. I got it free to lay. I was in a big, formal company, hierarchical, consumer packaged goods company, and I had a boss that was, shall we say, participative in, my, in, the management, in a management style. I'm going to call him Mike, because his his name, Mike was his name. <laughs> and I shouldn't say his last name. I think this is being videotaped, because I think that would be indiscreet. Hogan, Mike Hogan. <laughs> and I actually got an email from Mike yesterday. He picked up the book, he read it, and he wrote me an email. I should, I should have brought my, I should have, I should read it to you. So Mike pulls me into his office. He said, you're insubordinate. You're a pain in the arse. Um, you're recalcitrant. I had to look that one up. I didn't know it recalcitrant. <laughs> you're recalcitrant, and I don't want you on my team anymore. And I said, I said, Mike, am I getting fired? And he said, not technically, but good luck finding somebody who wants to work with you. So I peddled my shoddy wares and found that I had a bit of a reputation as being a rebel rouser and difficult to manage and impatient. And uh, I finally found someone who would take me in. This guy from Canada had just moved from Canada, and so he didn't know my reputation. <laughs> so he took me in, Stephen Quinn, and I have Stephen, I think Stephen to thank for my, uh, my, my career recovery because he took a real interest in me. He helped me work on this. Here's what I was. Brooke can tell you this because Brooke read, read my results. I, I spiked in two areas, leisurely, and mischievous, and I'm going to read you the definitions. Leisurely tends to question the competence of senior management. <laughs> Overly independent, ignores others' requests, can be uncooperative when pressed. That's exactly what happened to me with Mike Hogan when I got kicked off his team, put on a secondary brand. And my friends were VPs and directors, and I was still a manager level person. I was a manager for 11 years before I finally got out of this rut and started getting promoted. Mischievous, tests limits, can get bored easily and act impulsively. So my point in this is, if I had taken the Hogan or I had higher self-awareness, I wouldn't have gotten demoted, kicked off this guy's team, and flatlined in my career for several years. I just didn't have the self-awareness. So I'm going to make an offer. And Lonnie, I didn't even, where's Lonnie? I didn't even tell you about this. But <clears throat> the Hogan costs about, about 1000 bucks, Brooke? It costs about a grand, and you need a coach to, to read it. So take the Hogan if you really are interested in this. But I saw, being a good entrepreneur, I hacked the Hogan. <laughs> so I'm happy to send people the hack I did, so you can just kind of get a flavor for which one of these things you might spike in if you're interested. So if you're interested, I can send that to Fan, and we can make that available, OK? So what do you do if you're Captain Fantastic? It's pretty straightforward. You have to seek performance feedback on a regular, ongoing basis. The most successful leaders, and I'll read the stat from my research, Top-ranked leaders whose average score is the 85th percentile on leadership effectiveness in their organization are rated in the top 10% in terms of asking for performance feedback. So they don't run into brick walls and they don't have these blind spots that I had earlier. So the world's simplest feedback method, a friend of mine, Craig Wartman, does this all the time. The minute you go through a presentation, the minute you do anything with, you know, that's important, you ask people that you worked with, Tell me one thing I did well, and then I'll tell you one thing I think I did well. Tell me one thing I could have done differently, and then I'll tell you one thing I think I could have done differently. It takes five minutes. If you get in the habit of doing that, every time you present, you end up being able to make these adjustments. So every time I finish one of these presentations, and I've been doing a bunch of them the last couple weeks, I ask the people, what went well, what would you do differently if you were me? So seek feedback. I know it sounds, it sounds obvious, but it's not you know, every, every year in the performance review time that we should seek feedback. It's, it's right after every time we have a big important meeting or a presentation, we could seek it. 
Second reason people derail, this is the solo flyer. She's so good at what she does that she wants to just keep doing it. She's so good as an individual contributor that she gets promoted into a management position, and what does she do? She keeps wanting to do it herself. She doesn't teach them to fish, she keeps wanting to fish. And what happens to her team? They get demotivated, they feel disempowered, and eventually there's a coup d'etat. So this happens a lot to people in the earlier stages of their career. There's a woman named Linda Hill from Harvard who wrote a book called Becoming a Manager, and she did basic ethnographic research. She followed around 20 new managers and noted what they did wrong. And she found out that, number one, they were so good they just kept wanting to do what they did well. I interviewed a really good executive coach from the Center for Creative Leadership, and she said, fabulous performers get a team and still behave like all the ideas have to come from them. So she micromanages, she overmanages, and people feel unempowered, disempowered. Secondly, she doesn't develop her team. There is a talent organization called Lominger that recruiting firm Corn Ferry bought, Lominger. They look and track 67 management competencies. Guess which competency is 67th in terms of managerial effectiveness? Developing others. The last worst competency of managers is developing their people. Third, they don't manage, she doesn't manage context. Now, what do I mean by that? I think this was the most interesting thing in this, in this group. It's one thing for me to manage you. It's another thing for me to manage the team. But my job isn't just managing you one-to-one -one or managing the team. My job is to get you guys resources so you can be effective in your jobs. I should be spending half my time aligning with, comp with other departments where we have dependencies and making sure that I understand their goals, they understand our group's goals, so I get my group resources. And the solo flyer doesn't understand to be a manager, she needs to be spending a lot, of, a lot of her time greasing the skids with other departments, understanding their goals and objectives, them understanding her goals and objectives, horse trading, helping each other out. So this is a solo flyer. What is the most important, and by the way, in the book I have like five to eight remedies per derailment area. I'm just giving you one as a flavor. So one of the most important ones, it's so obvious, but let the team know you care about them. Managers who involve their teams in goal setting are four times more engaged, the employees are, than employees that don't, that don't have that relationship with their manager. That's based on 60 million people in a Gallup study. So, do you know your team members' kids' names? Do you know your team members' hobbies? Do you know what they value? Do you know what they aspire to? Have you put together a development plan to help them reach their aspirations? Let them know you care about them. You know, when I, when I hear, well, um, you know, Work is work and personal is personal. I don't like to mix the two. That's just crap. I mean, come on. We're all humans. We work 11 hours a day or whatever. If work isn't personal, what is it? So get to know that your people that work for you is what I would tell the solo flyer. Okay. This was the third reason this happens to people, version 1.0, as we age. I'm terrified of this one. I'm a venture capitalist. I'm 54, and I listen to 30-year-olds who've developed software all day long. And I'm so scared that I'm going to be the grape that's shriveling and turning into a raisin on the vine because of this. You've got to stay fresh. How, you know, just like, how do you keep love fresh? How do you keep your career skills fresh? Because this fellow would call himself a traditionalist, but he is calcified, ossified, more odd word, ostracized, and he's turning into a dinosaur. And what's gonna to happen to him is he's just out of date and he's gonna be put out to pasture. So what does he have problems with? He has difficulty adapting to changing circumstances. 
And these changing circumstances could be, uh-oh, technology disruption, along comes the internet, how is Microsoft going to adapt and start creating in a cloud environment? Uh-oh, internet comes along, how is electronic arts going to start changing their go-to-market strategy with games? All of a sudden, they got to create networked games online instead of sending Madden football or NBA Live through retailers. So it could be a technology change, like AI's come along, big data and machine learning has come along, cloud-based SaaS software's come along. How are we learning about these areas and changing the way we work based on them? The change can also be a new boss comes into the picture that has a different management style than your old boss, and you have trouble adapting to them. That's what happened to me. I had a really, really hands-off strategic boss, and then I got a new guy, and he had a different style, and I did not adapt well to his, his style. So there's also these rigid personality traits that version 1.0 has. You know, he's a traditionalist. He says, look, I do sales and I don't, under, I don't need to understand all this digital marketing mumbo jumbo. Well, you know what you do? Because to get lead generation for sales, you have to do digital marketing nowadays. You have to take the time to understand this. So how do you keep freshening your skills? That's the problem with this fella. So what do you do? You've got to improve your learning agility. Corn Ferry, a top tier rec recruiting and consulting HR firm, said that the best predictor of senior management potential are people that have high learning agility. So what is learning agility? It's open-mindedness. It's being reflective. But mostly it's being curious. My dad, who's in the audience, has the best learning agility of anybody I've ever met in my entire life. He's always consuming knowledge and trying to, trying to you know, refresh his skills. Five areas in particular. There's this book by Clayton Christensen, the Harvard professor. He wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. He wrote this book called The Innovator's DNA. Lonnie, I was just thinking of something else. I can send a reading list based on this talk, if you'd like, the books that I read to inform this. So, Innovator's DNA. He looks at leaders and he realizes they, they break out into people with delivery skills. Executing, analyzing, communicating, planning, and leaders with discovery skills. Orga, you know, observing, questioning, experimenting. So look at some of these things. Questioning. Are you asking what if, how might we, and why? So I was lucky enough to be in three meetings with Steve Jobs when I was at Walmart, and I'd heard what a jerk he was. I can tell you that he asked better questions than anybody in the room and more questions than anybody in the room. Christensen found that people that are high innova on innovation have a ratio of questions asked to statements made of six to one. Isn't that interesting? Six to one. So asking lots of why, how might we, what if questions. Secondly, observational skills. So I was talking to this guy who was a product manager of an adult diaper. And I was with one of my fellow professors. And we said, how long have you been a marketing manager on the adult diaper brand? And he said, four years. And we said, what's it like to wear them? Well, I'm not incontinent. No, I know, but what's it like to wear them? What's, when you pee in them, what's it like to walk around with the pee pee? <laughs> I haven't peed in the, in the diaper and, and walked around. Why haven't you? That's what your consumers are doing. Observational skills is getting in the mindset of the customer, living, seeing how they live their life, ethnographically, watching them go through life in a day, observing them. You know how Scott Cook, Cook came up with Intuit? He watched his wife doing taxes at the t kitchen table and said, there's got to be a better way to do it than this. And it's TurboTax. So observational skills. Third, the king of experimentation, Jeff Bezos. He said, I haven't failed. I've just found a 1,000 things that haven't worked. It's that attitude of constantly testing and testing and testing and, and, and creating hypotheses and then going in the market and testing their validity. It's like a scientific exper experiment. Fourth, there's a book called How to Be a Star at Work that talks about 
what high potential people do, and they network really well. They have a high-speed network of knowledge workers that they rely on to help do their jobs. So that's a big question for, for people in the audience that are younger is, are you establishing a strong network around you to help get answers to questions you don't know? Because networking is critical. And then the grand poobah is associational thinking. Taking disparate things and figuring out how they, how they connect together. Einstein, called, said, Einstein said, creativity is nothing more than combinatorial play. You know, the example of George Mistral walking his sheepdog in the Alps and then comes home and picks all the burrs out, and what does he come up with? Velcro. So, the fourth reason people derail, this is the one-trick pony. This person is very competent. She's moved up linearly in her organization. Maybe she's a controller. Maybe her name is Gail. Maybe she's talking to Ron, her boss, who's the CFO and it's her review. And Ron gives her an above target rating and says, Gail, you had another terrific year. You got us off of uh, QuickBooks. Um, our, floats, our floats up. We had no accounting errors. Good job. And, she's, and, and she says, you know, Ron, I'd really like to, be the, I'd like, to, I'd like to work my way to be a CFO. And he says, but you're doing exactly what you're meant to do. And she says, well, I'd like to, get, I'd like to go after this position. You know, maybe not with you, but maybe in one of our other divisions. And he said, but you don't understand forecasting. You don't understand capital asset management. You don't understand how to work within the operational group and make them more efficient in their line jobs. And she said, well, you've, you've never given me access to that. This is the problem. Pigeonholed into doing something really well, but not moving laterally to gain more knowledge around areas that you don't know. And that's what happens to this person. Guess what the number one derailer for women is? Being viewed as non-strategic. Now, do you think women are fundamentally non less strategic than men genetically? Of course not. This is an access problem. This is an access to opportunity issue that Gail has. So, she has an overdependence on one skill that she's very good at. She may have a key skill deficiency in an area that's really important to the business. If you're at, um, if you're at, if you're at Frito-Lay, people know that, it's a big brain. What do you have to understand? Key skill, what do you, what, you can't have a key skill deficiency in what area if you're at Frito-Lay. No matter what, you have to have a basic understanding of what. Somebody yell it. Marketing. What? Marketing. Marketing? Yeah, it's an impulse buy. You're, we're selling branded air, right? <laughs> you better understand how to market this thing because it's impulse buy. We always do new flavors and new, new packaging, uh, right? Marketing, what else you, be, you better have a basic understanding of if you're at Frito-Lay? Teenagers, <laughs> that's true. Doritos, sales and distribution. That is a distribution company. There's 22,000 route people. They're calling on accounts all over the country, and it's an impulse buy right at arm's length. So you have to be in every single convenience store, gas store, supermarket, mass merchant, every you know, uh, wholesaler. And so you have to understand distribution. Even if you're an accountant, you have to understand distribution. So. The solo fly, or the, uh, the one trick pony has a problem. She is good at one thing and she doesn't understand the key aspects of the business. So if I got a hold of the one trick pony, here's what I would do. I would say, let's help you understand the critical path of your organization. Now I'm gonna get a little wonky here, okay? For this is a, kind of a little business wonky. So what's the critical path? It's the key activities that drive customer value, the end value of the customer. And every company has a critical path, and there's probably four to eight things on the critical path, and we have to understand those components in our companies to be able to continue to have a broader view of our, of our company and continue to get uh, progress in our careers. So here's, here's an example from Walmart. I apologize, this is my one wonky slide. So if you're at Walmart, and I'm sitting there with Gail, and Gail says, I don't want to be the one trick pony. I want to be able to broaden in my career. I would say, okay. Let's say we're at Walmart. Let's lay out the value chain of Walmart and identify the critical path. 
If you're at Walmart, the critical path is sourcing. You gotta buy those products as cheaply as possible because it's a everyday low price. Merchandising, assortment planning, right? Good, better, best, pricing it and staying in stock. Logistics, managing those warehouses so you get the product into the stores well. And store operations, specifically managing the labor of a super center, that's 700 employees, and making sure that action alley where people are buying along the key areas is merchandised really effectively. If, if Gail, we lay out the, the value chain. By the way, notice what's not on the critical path. Marketing, finance, real estate, HR, IT, all those are support functions. This is the critical path of what you really have to understand to add value to the customer experience. So I would sit down with Gail and I would say, let's get you to spend time with somebody who's really knowledgeable in each of these six areas. If she spent a half a day, that's only three, four days max, if she spends it with the expert in each of these areas, I guarantee you she would not be considered non-strategic after doing this because she's gonna understand what the critical path is of Walmart and how Walmart adds value to the customer. This, that one drives me crazy because that is so solvable. I had a review in 92 where I was told I was non-strategic. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, well, you don't understand the big picture. Well, I'm like, I'm like 27. Of course I don't understand the big picture yet, you know? <laughs> so the last one is the whirling dervish. Smart, capable, idea factory. Lots and lots of ideas, but they just poof, isn't, isn't well planned, isn't organized, doesn't prioritize, doesn't understand which activities are the really high leverage ones that I have to do and which ones can I just sweep off my plate. Has trouble with, do, with, with process management. So if you're gonna be involved in a project, how long does it take cradle to grave to complete the project? The whirling dervish here would say, yeah, we can get that done by June. And you'll say, look, FDA approval is not going to come till May. Then we've got to get film and packaging. We have to source it. We've got to move it through a distribution system onto shelf. We're not going to get this thing done till December. You overpromised. And lastly, often is a pleaser and his eyes are bigger than his stomach. Always says yes before he gets his job done. So. He has got to learn to say no with grace. And here's, I have, a, I suffer from this tendency. So I read The Power of a Positive No by William Urey, who wrote the book Getting to Yes on Negotiations. Fabulous book, The Power of a Positive No, because he talks about, remember when you're saying no to somebody, you're saying yes to something else that's really important in your life. You're saying yes to your workout and your health. You're saying yes to your family, having dinner with them. You're saying, you know, you're saying yes to, to clearing your mind and going for a walk. Remember what you're saying yes to when you say no. The other thing is, learn a five minute no. The five minute favor. So, this just happened to me. I was asked to go to San Francisco to do a recruiting speech for, on behalf of Kellogg to high potential prospects. And I, you know, doing all this stuff I'm doing right now, I don't have the time. So I said to the director of admissions, I, I, I can't do that right now, but if you identify few people that are entrepreneurial, I'll call them and talk to them about Kellogg. So I did a five minute, I turned it into a quote, you know, it'll take a couple hours of my time, but it isn't like flying out to San Francisco. So it's saying no with grace by doing a five minute favor. One of the things that the whirling dervish does is over promises and people end up distancing themselves from the whirling dervish because they can't, the whirling dervish cannot be counted on to deliver when they say they will deliver. They let people down and people distance themselves from them. So those are the five. Interpersonal issues is Captain Fantastic. Do you understand your dark side tendencies? The solo flyer, great individual contributor, gets a team and still tries to do it herself. Version 1.0, getting complacent. The one trick pony, too narrow, needs to broaden and understand how all the pieces fit together in the business. And the whirling dervish, 
not delivering on promises because they don't, aren't well organized and can't prioritize and can't say no. So with that, for the next 10 minutes and then we're done, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what do people with the right stuff do differently? What do high potential, high performers do that we can all learn from? First, they are self-aware. They know what they're good at. They know what they stink at. They understand what motivates them. So they put themselves in positions to succeed because they're doing what they should be doing with their time, with their self-awareness. They put themselves in the right position and they know how to be effective with people. Secondly, they have two key strengths. So most companies have, you know, 10 or 12 competencies they, they rate us on. Analytical thinking, creativity, vision, team management, you know, whatever, 10 or 12. There's only two that high potential high performers have in spades that are super important to have, and I'll share those with you in a minute. Okay, so this was the statistic in my research that shocked me more than anything. People that have an overestimate their interpersonal effectiveness, their, their, their skill level, and underestimate their interpersonal issues, they drill 600% more, six times more. And this is straight data. This is looking at 360s. People that have high potential, high performers, when they rate themselves, they might say, I'm kind of a two on creativity, and their peers would say, yeah, you're a two on creativity on a scale of one to five. They might say, yeah, I'm a four in analytical thinking, and their peers and subordinates and superiors would say, yeah, you're a four. They're closer in the way they rate themselves to their raters. So they're, they have an accurate conception of themselves so they can put themselves in the right positions, whereas these people are clueless. So I said that they understand their motives. They are self-aware, but they understand their motives. So let's talk about what do you value? It's fairly easy for us to talk about what we value. If I asked Jen what you value, you'd probably be able to say, I value my dogs, I value my friendships, and I meet at 5.30 with Katrine, and we have a wonderful time together. If I asked you, Jen, what motivates you? What are your motives? It's a little trickier, because motives are subconscious. They're sort of latent. And that motives are what give us energy. So if you look at this picture, to try to get at this, a research firm called the Hay Group did something called the picture story exercise. And they, should, they put together 10 pictures. And they said, they're kind of ambiguous pictures. They said, what's going on in this picture? And you have to write a paragraph about what's going on. And then a social psychologist marks everything you said and identifies your motive profile. So if I look, this is like one of the pictures. What would you say is going on in this picture? Someone is mansplaining. That is the power motive, is the filter, is the lens you looked at. Your interpretation of that was through the lens of power. Good. Somebody else, something different. What? Teaching, still the power motive, still the power motive. What else? Collaborating. Uh, Gail and Henry have worked together for six years in the lab. They, they really trust each other. They have a great relationship. They have complementary skills and they're friends. That's the affiliation motive. Anybody else see anything different? Showing a problem. Good. Problem. Excellent. That's achievement motive. They're trying to solve a problem. They're trying to solve, they're trying to create the cure for the Zika virus. And they have very promising results. That's the achievement motive. So three of the biggest motives that a guy named David McClellan from Harvard identified are achievement, affiliation, and power. Achievement, the desire to keep improving. You want to keep score. You want to know how you're doing. Affiliation, relational closeness with others, friendships. Power, influencing other, having status. So. I asked the Hay Group that did the picture story exercise, do different positions inside of companies have different motive profiles? And this woman said, well, yeah, they do. So she went back to her data and she said, I said, what is a corporate CEO's 
motive profile look like? What do you think it looks like? What's it going to look like in achievement? High or low? What's it going to look like in affiliation, high or low? What's it going to look like in power? You got it. I said, does an entrepreneurial CEO look the same as a corporate CEO? What do you think? What do they look like in achievement? What do they look like in affiliation? What do they look like in power? Oh, you're a smart group. <laughs> I asked, what does a product manager look like? Like a good PM. Technical, you know, they understand technology, they understand R&D, they understand the business side. And she said, oh, they're the decathletes. They're kind of good across the board. <laughs> they're, a, they're, they're high in achievement because they've got to get the product out the door on time. They're high in affiliation because they've got to work well with cross-functional groups that don't report to them. And they're high in power because they have to cajole people to you know, get this stuff done. They are great. They get paid so much because they're really, really versatile. So I took the test. Here is me. <laughs> 95th percentile in achievement. Every, every story was like, oh, they're about to solve this. or think, you know. Um, high in affiliation, 7th percentile in power. And then I took the Hogan test, 7th percentile again in power. So the person that was, that, was, that was the social psychologist said to me, was it hard to be a CEO when your power motive is so low? And I said, I didn't like the job. I got no satisfaction out of being a CEO. I didn't like it because it didn't fit my motive profile. So what I did in the book is I ask eight questions of each of the motive. Now, I should add, I put two more motive elements in here. If you read Dan Pink's book, Drive, and I called Dan and got and actually started establishing a relationship with him, because I think McClellan identified three big ones, but autonomy is a big motivator for people, and purpose is a big motivator for people. A sense of purpose. I believe in sustainability. I, I'm all about education, you know. Um, autonomy, I want discretion over my work. I want to be a self-starter. I want freedom of movement. So I found five, and I found eight questions that you can ask people that will help them identify their own motive profiles, especially for the young ones in the audience or if you have kids. This is my favorite chapter. It's chapter eight in the book, and it looks at people's motives. Because if you can put yourself in the right position where you have energy, there's no way you're not gonna do well. So you can see a couple of these questions. Purpose, I choose work that fits into my value system. Autonomy, I would rather struggle with the answer than be told it. My wife would say, oh yeah, Carter, you're like that for sure. <laughs> so what's your motive profile? People with the right stuff understand their motives, and as a result, they put themselves in the right work context. I did not put myself in the right work context by the end of my business career. I had a review, and they said, well, next we want to make you the CEO of Sam's Club. We want you to move to Bentonville. We want you to work under Doug McMillan. He's going to go to International, and you're going to run Sam's Club. So Allison and I actually flew to Bentonville to see if we wanted to live in, in Bentonville, and we decided to pass on that opportunity, didn't we? Um, but when I had this review, and they told me that this would be, you know, this is what they wanted to groom me for, I felt no energy at all. I drove home, and I thought, oh, man, I'm going to be flying all over the place, visiting stores, and it's just, it's a big company, and I realized I didn't have any energy for it. I was in the wrong job. And now I'm a teacher and I'm a venture capitalist. I have to be two places a week. On Monday, I have to be in our partner meeting at Pritzker Group. And on Tuesday, I have to teach. Other than that, good luck finding me. I have autonomy and freedom of movement, which for me is really, really important. So put yourself in the right context. OK, here's the last point. I looked at all of these 360s, and people in the top, the 90th percentile of their company, if they only had one competency out of 10, say, and it was build strong relationship, 12% of them were in the top 90th percentile. Got it? If they only had one competency and it was drive for results, 14% of them were in the 90th percentile. 
but look what happens if you have that combo. If, you have, if you're good at building strong relationships with other people, enlisting others by being open-minded, by being compassionate, by asking good questions, if you can enlist them and you have the drive to get things done and complete, and those are the only two competencies you have, none other, the chances are 72% you're gonna be in the 90th percentile of leadership effectiveness in your company. So people with the right stuff are self-aware and understand their motives, so they put themselves in the right positions at work. They work on things that give them energy. They are good at building relationships with others and enlisting them. They can harness and move people towards an end. And they, if, if they said they're gonna get it done Friday, they're gonna be there till midnight getting it out the door because they said they were gonna do it. So, capable people derail, not because they aren't skilled, and, or not because, by the way, IQ is very low on the list of why people fail. It isn't about IQ. It's often about lack of self-awareness and lack of self-understanding. So you put yourself in the wrong positions and you don't realize the impact you're having on other people by poor behavior. People with the right stuff are self-aware, they're more self-aware, and they put themselves in the right positions to succeed. So, here's an eye chart that nobody can read. <laughs> I just thought I'd finish with an eye chart that nobody can read. This is good for the video, I suppose. This is a list of all of the key behavioral areas on the left. People with the right stuff have these green skills that are in, really, really important and people with the wrong stuff in this red area, this is where they fail. Thank you. Just raise your hand right there. If you could stand up for your question, please, also. Okay, um, I have a friend <laughs> who is a whirling dervish, and so I would imagine some of these poor organizational skills, trouble prioritizing, doesn't understand, pro I, I would imagine those would be difficult things for that person to remediate. So do you have any suggestions for either opportunities that would be good for that kind of person or yeah. how to? Did everyone out? hear that question? I know the- A friend like, that's a whirling dervish. Thank you. Opportunities to remediate. A couple things. Um, you know, sometimes you, you don't wanna work against yourself. If this person just is naturally like this, one thing is, if it, do they work in a work environment with other people or alone with other people? I mean, I would try to have somebody who's very strong with project management or program management to be their partner. So if you, know, if you have a weak area, you try to, you know, you to complement your, your, yourself with, it, with somebody who's strong in that area. So one is, I would say if she's naturally, he's naturally not good at program management or project management, get somebody next to them working alongside of them who is. But um, there's, May, you know, there is no question that you can improve in this area, and there's systematic ways you can improve by using you know, heuristics and using tools. So a guy named David Allen has a, some of the best books I've read on how to be efficient and effective with your time. Making things work, getting things done, is I think getting things done is his bestseller, and I read it cover to cover to try not to be the whirling dervish. The other thing I think for the whirling dervish is, lots of times they work in response mode. Emails come in, texts come in, and they always stop what they're doing. Phone call. Really try hard to set aside blocks of time when you're most productive to get your, your important thinking work done, the work that's gonna move the needle. And in your times that you're, non, you're less productive naturally, answer phone calls, return emails, have meetings, et cetera. There's a new book by Dan Pink called When, and Dan looks at how important time of day is for each one of us and to understand when are we most effective. Mine time is 5.30 in the morning to about 10, and that is time I just safeguard so carefully and I do all my thinking work. And then I realize from 10 on I'm gonna be in meetings and I'm gonna have calls and I'm gonna to respond to emails. And then I go back to another block of thinking time from about 1.30 to three and then I turn into a turn up at three. So, you know, when are you productive? Do your thinking work then, but also try to get along, try to get somebody at your side who's good where you're weak, I think is a, is a good idea. 
Question on my side, anyone? I'll make a parenthetical. We're in talking to Dan Pink. I think he's coming in in March for fans. So, oh, awesome. Uh, keep a heads up on that. And that's primarily thankful to Carter for that. Any question on my side? Susan, you have someone on your side? Right here. Okay, could you stand up, men, please? And keep the microphone by your mouth, would be great. Hi, Hi. Uh, Hi. why is being dutiful a dark personality trait? I'm sorry? Why is being dutiful a dark personality trait? Yeah, dark side is the term that it's a term that they use, which is that under pressure, especially, you have these tendencies to sabotage yourself. So in this case with dutiful, you can be overly compliant. Sometimes you can be passive and you can hurt yourself and hurt your own causes. So it's not dutiful in a way that is being, um, you know, um, a good soldier, it's being dutiful in the way that's hurting yourself by your passivity. So um, I actually was very close to being rated a danger area on dutiful. And it goes along with being a, ple a, being a pleaser. So part of self-awareness is understanding what your own needs are. And if you're overly dutiful, maybe you aren't, you, know, you aren't taking time for yourself because you're so dutiful to other people. And so it can turn into a dark side because you can end up self-sabotaging because you're so helpful, but you're, not, but you're not taking enough time for yourself. Carter here. You can stand up. Keep, keep it close. Okay. Hi. Um, do you find there are certain personality traits that align with certain um, uh, times in a life? So say... For example, the version 1.0. You, yes. you get you get that you get an image of that person in your in yes. your head. Are there um, certain times of life that you would expect someone to go through? Yes. A stage. The most yes. Captain Fantastic is is the story of people at later stages of their career. CEO Hubris just rife with why CEOs fail is a great book, and he just talks about people that don't listen. So I think it's easy for us to start believing we have the answers if we're successful and we stop having that beginner's mindset. So Captain Fantastic is really potent as people get older and you start getting overly confident and you stop, you start thinking you have all the answers, you stop asking questions. Solo Flyer is early to middle career when you haven't learned how to manage effectively and haven't realized that your job is to empower others, not do the work yourself anymore. Version 1.0 starts getting to be dangerous mid-career when we get sort of, sort of set in a routine and we stop being curious and we think we're sort of, we're in a good groove. No, you have to stay paranoid. You have to stay paranoid. <laughs> one trick pony is a weird one because maybe you want to be a one trick pony. Maybe you love software application development and you don't want to progress any further. You just want to make sure you can continue doing what you love. So the one trick pony is the most interesting to me, really, because it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a one trick pony if you love what you're doing. It hurts people in their careers when they want to continue to rise into broader uh, functional roles and they are pigeonholed as being good at only one thing. So one trick pony, I would say, for the first four or five years of your career, you have to be a one trick pony to be competent in a functional area. You know the 10,000 hours rule, right? That's the work based on uh, Anders Ericsson, and Jen Jeffrey Colvin wrote about it in um, Why Talent is Overrated, and I think Out Gladwell wrote about it in Outliers. But basically, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice leads to expertise and competence. And if you do the math on 10,000 hours, it's about five years. So I always say to people like at Kellogg, spend the first four or five years just getting good at something, because that's your career capital. Then start looking for opportunities to broaden outside of that functional role if you want to avoid the one-trick pony. So I think the one-trick pony starts hurting us mid-career too. And then the whirling dervish can hurt us at any time, at any time. And I, in, uh, on my website, I have the assessment, so you can take it if you go to cartercast.com backslash resources. Um, but seriously, the number one self-rated derailer by people that have filled it out, and it's way over 1,000 people now, is the whirling dervish. And I think it's because of the time we live in. I think we all just feel overwhelmed by all the digital communication and we feel harried and we feel like we can't focus. So I think, I think the whirling dervish is like a state that we're all in, uh, unfortunately. So that can hit you at any time. Susan, okay, oh, over here, Carter. Over on your left, Carter. 
Thanks for coming. Uh, Thank of you. your one through five derailers, number one and number five seem a little bit more innate than two, three, four, uh, which uh, seems like the organizations can help solve aggressively. Oh, so yeah. would, would better selection at the first promotion level away from number one and number five uh, create more out, better outcomes? If I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying some of these are skill gaps that are solvable with training and development. Some of them are personality or could be behavioral and could be more difficult. Yes. Absolutely. Captain Fantastic sometimes need a two by four on the side of the head, and even then it might not work. But you know, they have to have a mirror held up to them to understand that this, this style of management is not working. One trick ponies that are too narrow, I believe you can solve for that if they want to. Right? Whirling dervishes, you can help with managerial techniques and with organization. You can help get them better. Version 1.0, I mean, if you, you, of course, we can overcome that by staying curious. I would ask you, who's on your Twitter feed? How many, who are you tracking on Twitter? I track all these venture capitalists. So I see what they're looking at and I read all the white papers they post. So, yes, you're right. The hardest one, I think, to overcome is interpersonal issues that are driven by behavioral challenges because there can be more personality based. Good question. Carter, right here by me. So when you look at these archetypes, and it's a follow up to his question, when you put teams together, especially global teams, what are you seeing as far as the efficacy since culture is such a huge driver in business? And you're looking at different ethnicities and different responses to the challenges the digital dementia you talked about, the overflow. So just comment a little bit about how it works, say, in Middle Eastern countries or South Pacific. Or well, I will tell you that when I looked at this, these derailers were global. Many of these studies were global, these 360s. So a lot of these, Africa was represented, the Middle East was represented, Europe was well represented, North America was well represented. The solo flyer, one of the biggest problems we have in building and leading teams is we don't hire for diversity. We hire mirror images of ourselves. We hire people we're comfortable with naturally. I have a situation, it, it, it was embarrassing. I, at our venture capital firm, there was an African guy who had an accent and I didn't connect with them because we just didn't share anything in common. And I, th I wanted this other guy that was from the Midwest and we got along and we had a nice conversation. Well, we, we went with the African guy who was the best guy we've ever hired. And it just was this great lesson for me of unconscious bias. So the solo flyer really suffers from lacking diversity in building a well-balanced team. So that would be the major comment I found in my research, the major, major point in my research is, one of the biggest reasons the solo flyer fails is they don't have a very well-rounded team with different skill sets and different knowledge, you know, different knowledge and, and strength areas. Susan, you have someone? Right there, could you grab, or right here? Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Uh, while you are showing the PowerPoint, I remember seeing a slide. Uh, with interpersonal issues, it's very high, and a person having uh, overestimate on the skill level, the 620 percentage of derailment is supposed to happen. First of all, that number is very staggering and very high, yeah. which is a recipe for disaster, which is in the making. Yeah. Now, uh, my question would be, how to identify such people and not to board them uh, into the team, or if they come into the team, how to overcome this and avoid it. Yeah, so he saw the 620% number and it was staggering. He said, how do you avoid getting people like that into the team? Basically, you're saying, how do you, try, how do you hire for people that are self-aware is really, I think, the answer. And so in interviews, boy, I am a hawk. First of all, um, a guy named Jeff Smart from GH Smart wrote this fabulous book about interviewing, and I had him in my class last spring. Jeff Smart, G-E-O-F-F, -F, Smart. He wrote a book on how to hire well, and he says you can't hire somebody after interviewing them 45 minutes. You need two hours, and it needs to be behavioral interview. Then you have to take them to dinner and see how they treat the wait staff, see what their spouse or their partner is like, see how they do when they've had a couple cocktails, 
Um, but the process of interviewing, you want to ask a lot of questions to get at someone's self-conception, self-understanding, and self-awareness. You want to see how many times they say I and me when they talk about accomplishments versus we, because we know business is just a set of interdependencies. There's no I. It's stuff we all do together to get things done. So you want to look for those cues. You want to ask them where they've struggled, where they've failed, and what they learned from it. And if they keep skirting those questions that have to do with self-understanding and overcoming adversity, you wonder what they've learned, and you probably don't want them. So you want to come up with as many questions around these key areas. Self-awareness, what motivates them? Ask them what they, you know, when do they feel their heart quicken? You know, what projects have been the most exciting to you? When you failed at a project, what was your role in the failure? What did you learn from it? You know, you want to ask them a lot of these hard kind of questions. And if they keep skirting them, it's danger versus saying, well, here's something I did wrong and here's what I learned from it and here's why I'm not doing it again. But Carter, let me ask you, because also a lot of people, especially, are fairly well uh, trained now in interviewing yeah. um, as the applicant. And so things like, well, be prepared to tell somebody how you failed and how you managed to get it. So I'm wondering, do you have sort of like a couple back pocket questions that are a little bit more unexpected that kind of in that moment uh, kind of drops the very practice facade of the person you're interviewing and you can kind of get that flash of insight about them. Well, I, I watched Jeff Smart in my class. He said to me before the class, he goes, okay, who can I bring up here and really put through the paces that's not gonna cry? <laughs> and I said, I got a military guy, Will. <laughs> bring him up and I walked up to Will who was a submarine officer, believe it or not. I said, Will, would you do this in front of the class? He goes, yeah, I'll do it. And he dissected Will. He said, tell me about a problem you've had on the sub where you were accountable. What happened? And Will said, eh, and then we got around it. He said, no, I want, exa I want you to tell me exactly, tell me your decision tree and how you went about making your decision and how the decision was faulty. He ended up, it's this, I think it's the Socratic, you keep going one deeper on the question and you end up getting to the gold after a while. You can. But it, I think it's, it's a, you, have to have a, you have to be a courageous interviewer. Mm -hmm. You even say, look, this is going to be a little bit uncomfortable because I'm trying to, I'm going to be digging. Mm -hmm. Okay? But, you know, if you aren't forthcoming, it, the interview is going to go nowhere. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, I believe what Jeff said. I can't interview anybody anymore for under, 90 minutes anyway, because you just can't get at anything. You talk about the weather, how was your drive in, you know, you end up, get some coffee, how's the coffee, it's too weak, let's get you some more coffee, and you end up going nowhere. You gotta go two hours. <laughs> All right, let's grab one more question, because I know Carter wants to get out there, sign some books, get his son back home and get him to bed. Uh, so let's take one more question. Susan, I think right you here. had someone yeah. right here. Yeah. Yep. This, this young man, what's your name again? was in, I did a, a session at New Trier today with entrepreneurs, and he, he asked more good questions. All right. Um, so how do you find yourself in a position at a company or like a career? Um, like you said, you were the CEO of Walmart, right? That no, you like, that doesn't match your motive set. Like, how do you avoid that? Like, what are the steps that you took that like, one day you just got the position as a CEO, and you were like, I don't want to do this. Well, you know, you can, it's sort of the Peter principle, you can get promoted beyond the level that you should be. What I loved was Blue Nile, where I was with part of a small team building product. I was close to the customer experience. I was, you know, we were in a room, we were sketching out the product, we were together, there was high esprit de corps. You could see your progress. So I go to walmart.com and we were, there were only 30 of us launching it, and then there were 50 and there were 100, and then there were 1,000, and then there were 10,000, and I worked, I worked my way up to the CEO position sort of by accepting, you know, this is the next step. But what, here's the easiest thing to do. List the activities you do in your job. Not the role, the actual activities. I built a spreadsheet looking at a pricing analysis. I looked at packaging film and decided what color. List the activities you do this is what I did later, and then go green, yellow, red. I like doing it, I was neutral on it, I didn't like doing it. When I did that for the CEO job I had, there was about 30% that were green. 
When I did it when I was in charge of marketing for Blue Nile, it was about 70% were green. So what happened was when I actually got promoted, I got promoted outside of the areas that I had a passion for. And the best way I know to do it is look at the activity level. I mean, business is nothing more than a bunch of activities we do when we go into work, right? Our job is just a bunch of activities. List the activities you do and, and then say, do I like this activity? Am I neutral on it or do I despise it? When I was the CEO, I spent more time with HR and legal. HR issues, class action lawsuits, dealing with analysts, you know, working on the reputational damage of Walmart. It was all this big company stuff that I had no interest in. And I, and I finally was like, what, you know, how did, it, how did it come to this? So look at, at the activity level and make sure the activities you're doing excite you. Thank you so much, Carter. Excellent, thank you thank so you. much.